Okay, we're going to crack on. Um, welcome, everybody. This is the final webinar of Series 2 of the Recover and Rise program. So this is, this is the Ask the e Experts panel. Okay, so this, this session is being recorded and this will, be, this will be circulated to the wider West Sussex business community uh, uh, later as well. So we're going to have an exciting panel of digital trainers, digital champions, business support people, and also uh, businesses who are attending. Um, I've also captured a huge amount of questions from our attendees during the course of the webinars, and some of you, some of you know our businesses uh, on, uh, on, on here as well. And this whole session is to kind of wrap it all up, answer some of those burning questions. Um, you've got the experts here, and yeah, it's going to be quite an interesting, quite an interesting session. So um, I'm just going to, uh, we've just got a few introductions to do first, and then we're going to go into the panel. I'll explain exactly how everything is going to work. Okay, so. This is part of the uh, West Sussex Recover and Rise Digital Accelerating Program, all about enabling West Sussex businesses to get online, get more efficient, and grow their marketing. So this is Series 2, Customers and Marketing. There's two more series in this, uh, in this program of works, which are live on the Eventbrite website. So you've got systems and productivity, and you'll have growth and expansion. That's what's going live today. So you haven't booked onto one of those courses. I'd get on there and book on. It's all free, some amazing content and amazing webinars that have yet still to come. We're halfway now throughout the program. So here we go. Okay. So number eight in the series. Okay. This is our wrap up, the marketing panel with the experts. Um, I, am I an expert, Ollie? I'm not sure. I, I'm going to be the host. Self-proclaimed. Self but... That's right. I'm good at my, uh, nautical analogies. <laughs> No, but we're going to we're going to introduce all the panelists uh, quite shortly as well. But before before we just get kind of got, uh, drop into that, we've just got a few introductions uh, to make and a, just a few um, uh, uh, business support that we just want to make you aware of. So before we go into that, we're Creative Bloom, so we're curating this series. We're a search engine marketing agency, and we service uh, Sussex Sussex businesses, local businesses, charities, and green businesses. Okay. Okay, that's that's our pitch. All right, so digital champions, Karen, are you are you with us? I am. Good morning, everybody. Or even Hi, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good good morning. Okay, Karen. Um, uh, I've got a slide here for you. What? Tell us about the digital champions and what what, what the local businesses who are going to be what listening in now, and watching this later, can get from this amazing resource. OK, so um, I'm Karen. I'm a growth relationship associate for the Coast Capital Growth Hub. Um, you will also meet my colleague NASA later on in the networking session. And we have some of the digital champions on the call today. So for those of you that aren't aware, the Growth Hub uh, provides fully funded business support to uh, businesses of all sizes in the West Sussex um, area. Uh, our, our roles as growth relationship associates to have open and honest, frank conversations with business owners, uh, find out what their barriers and challenges to growth are, and then go off and um, signpost them or provide a range of support to help them overcome those barriers. Uh, for this programme here, we're delighted to have um, seven of our growth champions who specialise in the digital area. Um, and as part of this programme, all people that attend any of the workshops um, are able to access free um, um, hours, eight hours of support from a, a specialist who you will meet, um, the, as I say, the range of them later on. Um, and I think that's probably all I need to say for right now, I think. Yep, absolutely great. Thank you so much. So I've, uh, there's some contact details uh, we're going to post up on the end of this as well. And the digital champions who are present, you're going to be able to introduce yourself during the panel and just say what your speciality is for, for, for the coming up panel. Okay, lovely. Who's next? Rise. Do we have Zoe? We do. We do. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is working. This is yes. working. <laughs> Hi, so um, I'm one of the uh, one of two, um, actually three innovation advisors um, for the RISE programme. Now, the RISE programme is is brand brand new. 
We are funded by the West Sussex County Council and um, ERDF. Um, so we're, we're here to support all um, local West Sussex businesses and some coastal capital businesses too, SMEs, who um, have got some innovation idea or innovation um, sort of direction that they would like to move towards. So we can provide, it's all free, we can provide uh, workshops, we can provide access to university experts at Brighton and Sussex universities. And we're offering support in terms of very interesting diverse workshops around innovation um, and then being able to kind of do deeper dives into particular sectors. So we've got lots of layered opportunities for um, support for you. It's very much, RISE is really about, as you can see on the side, exploring ideas, developing your knowledge, building your capacity and unlocking the expertise. So that can be about sharing expertise and therefore transferring that knowledge into your companies to then develop and grow as businesses. So we're offering up to, um, the support package is up to seven seven thousand five hundred pounds. So it's quite a significant offer. And that can be in terms of um, the access to, to the experts at the university that you get kind of like one-to-ones with. So um, we are, are our portal is, is live, you can register all for free, and we look forward to welcoming businesses on board. Okay, wonderful, thank you for that. Again, another, some amazing, some amazing uh, resources available for, for the businesses in West Sussex. But that's not the only resource available to you, is it, Gareth, from Hot House? <laughs> business no, <hot> it's, <laughs> no, it's not, Stuart, and uh, thank, thanks for the introduction. I, I think, uh, yeah, I always get really tidy on these, uh, on these uh, uh, webinars, so I, uh, yeah, I'm slightly bizarre. But anyway, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me along to speak uh, at this last session, and good to see everybody here. So I'm Gareth, Gareth Sear. I work for the University of Chichester, but we run the Business Hot House program, where our focus is on supporting SME businesses across the coast capital region uh, through grants and guidance and to help them achieve growth. So we're also funded through the European Union Regional Development Fund, uh, West Sussex uh, local authorities, Brighton, Hove, uh, City Council as well. We've got six strands to our support. Uh, we, we run business startup boot camps. We run a um, productivity and growth uh, consultancy through the Sussex Innovation Centre. Uh, we run innovation support. This is more about the next step of innovation from where RISE were working with you uh, on. Um, we also do access to finance support. So if you're looking to raise funds for your digital innovation and your digital transformation in your business, we can support that. But that also supports our grant fund programme that we're delivering as well. So we've got the Invest4 grant fund programme and we've worked with a whole number of businesses to help them with digital transformation, whether that's through becoming e-commerce enabled, um, whether that's through uh, getting bespoke software made, whether that's about computerising um, machinery that they use in their production facilities. So there's a whole range of different things that we support businesses with through our grant fund. And then lastly, we offer or will be offering from January leadership and management development. So you can access up to 12 hours of free support through the Business Hot House program at pretty much any stage of your business. And then we've got a grant fund program that offers grants from 2000 all the way up to about 170,000 pounds. And okay. there's all my contact details. Wonderful. Okay, that's brilliant. Again, more amazing, more amazing resources available for uh, 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 these West Sussex businesses and Sussex. But is it just West Sussex, Gareth, or is it Sussex as well? No, we uh, it's West Sussex, Lewis, Brighton Hove City, and all the way up to um, East Surrey counties as brilliant. well. So it's the coast okay. capital region. Okay. Yep. Wider, m much wider remit. So if you are a business, one of those areas. You need a bit of help. You need, to, you know, with that, then you know, hop on, hop on there. Okay, right. Let's meet the panel. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you all. <laughs> there we go. So um, we should all be. Uh, hopefully, you are uh, familiar with Zoom. If you are a panelist, if you could just use for me the reaction to raise your hand, and I can introduce all of you into 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 the session. If you're a business attendee, what I'd say is. 
Uh, if you have any questions at all you want answering to the panel during the course of this session, pop it into the chat for me. And uh, Ollie, Ollie gives a wave. There we go. Ollie, Ollie is going to uh, keep an eye on those and we'll make sure that, you know, as you've attended, your questions do get answered. But we do have a whole host of questions uh, from, from our attendees from the course for, for, from this series as well. So without further ado, I'm just going to quickly introduce the panel. Rachel Dines. If you'd like to uh, just quickly introduce yourself and your speciality on this panel. <laughs> sure, thanks, Stu. Hi, everyone. I think most of you have seen me on some of this series by now, but um, I'm Rachel. I run Shake It Up Creative. We are a marketing agency in Worthing. Uh, we specialise in working with small businesses, and our core services cover SEO, website de design development, marketing campaigns, graphic design, and PR. I'm also a digital champion as well. Oh, so a digital champion, many hats. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, Lisa. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa from Consulting with Care. Um, my business is Strategic Business Advice, um, Leadership Consulting, and I'm a productivity expert. Um, in terms of digital, that's looking at systems, tools, processes, to make the business more efficient, to communicate with customers better, um, and to help with your team productivity. So I am one of the digital champions as well for Coast to Capital, um, and I will be presenting session five in the next series, which is all about productivity tools. So I'll be going through them in more detail there. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Pam. Technology fell. Okay, we'll move on. Ollie Sloan. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Ollie. I've been working with uh, Stuart Creative Bloom for the last uh, five years. Um, I like to take a more kind of psychological approach when I um, am dealing with uh, SEO, UX, and I also run the, the uh, paid advertising for Creative Bloom as well. So um, I kind of uh, dip my toe in quite a few different buckets to try and um, you know, as a consultant, give small businesses kind of quite a breadth of knowledge to to give them the best kind of um, idea of what's going to help get their business found online. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, Andrew Kerry Beal, I can see you there. Hi there. Um, yes, I'm Andrew from Get Consultants. Um, so uh, I've worked with Coast to Capital, people like Karen, for about the last uh, two three years, um, and I focus on IT strategy and digital marketing. Uh, based in Chichester. Um, so I help SMEs plan out um, an integrated digital marketing strategy uh, and how to use technology to improve things like customer communication uh, and project collaboration and staff productivity. And typical projects would be things like uh, websites, web analytics, uh, Google analytics, that sort of thing, uh, and social media, but all designed to get your business noticed um, and to help you take technology to add value uh, to your brands and services. Okay, excellent. Okay, Joe Brianti on our panel. Hi everyone, um, I'm Joe Brianti. I'm actually based in London, um, <clears throat> but I am a data protection officer and I provide a range of support services to small businesses and sole operators in the GDPR space. So that could be just giving you advice and guidance on how you are complying or not, as the case may be, doing website reviews, helping you manage a data breach or a, um, a subject access request, um, or just being a, a full data protection officer for your business on a remote basis. Okay, thank you. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, I think that's it from our panelists. Okay. Apart from you, mate. What do you do? Apart from, oh, for, apart from me. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm the host. I'm the host, so I get to be com comical throughout the session. But um, I'm Stu Davies, Head of Agency of Creative Bloom. Uh, my speciality is strategy, marketing strategy, and also search engine marketing uh, and everything that goes along with it. So there we go. That's our, that's our, that's our wonderful panel. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> how this is going to work, chat? is uh, our attendees may ask some questions. I've got a whole bank of questions I'm going to answer. As a panelist, if you want to answer one of the questions, if you stick your hand up um, using the Zoom, using the Zoom reactions, I'll go, around, I'll go around the panelists and we can get a good breadth of 
inputs and opinions on a particular on a particular question. Quite an informal session. So this is all about us just imparting our knowledge. Um, and this is, you know, this is going to be recorded. It's going to be sent out by uh, West Sussex to a lot of uh, West Sussex businesses. So we'll start with an easy one. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, it's going to be a strategy, a strategy question. So um, I'm, I'm going to group these into into different areas. So uh, first question came from came from one of our attendees from the, one of the early sessions, um, and it was, uh, how should how should I as a small business even go about trying to get to grips with a digital strategy. So let's see some panelists' hands up, please. Okay, see a few up there. Got any up there yet? Okay. Andrew, I can see you smiling. <laughs> it's a it's a very broad it's a very broad question this, but you know, give us a uh, give a give us a quick thirty second answer. <laughs> You're not kidding. It's a broad one. Um, so I think I, I think. Where would you thing... start? Where would I start? OK, I've got, you know, I'm busy. I've got, I'm running my business. Where do I even start with this? Exactly. And I think I think preparing to kind of introduce digital technology into a business. Uh, I mean, oddly, it's all the non tech stuff that you have to look at first. So it, it's things like, you know, do, do you have a business vision uh, and a mission uh, and a USP? And others? do you know where your your business is actually going? Because. Um, uh, unless you do and you've kind of got that messaging and the business plan behind it, then it's impossible to work out uh, how you actually are going to introduce yourself as a business then online, on social media and on a website, etc. Um, so you'll need a business plan and generally a sales and a marketing plan as well. Um, and you'll also need a plan that actually says, how are you going to communicate with your customers? Uh, and I think as Stuart introduced in one of the programmes earlier uh, in this series, one of the key things is understanding who your customers are um, and segmenting them into groups. So, you know, if you're a, a service business, for example, um, you might one minute be talking to a manufacturing business and a managing director. And another minute you might be talking to a, uh, a recruitment manager or somebody involved in marketing. And you're going to have to change the way that you position your business and your messaging accordingly. And that, of course, goes online, you know, whether you're communicating on social media, on websites, on email, or, or however. Um, and I think the other thing is, is taking that whiteboard that you've got sitting in the corner that you probably never used as well, uh, and trying to work out um, what are the clear descriptions of your business? What are the things that consumers are gonna want from you? Um, you know, how are you better than your competitors? Um, what exactly do you offer that other people don't? Um, and, and what is going to make people buy your products? So not just in terms of benefits and physical things, but also emotionally. Um, so it's things like that. I think uh, uh, hopefully that helps answer Stuart in terms of some of that. It's it's that prep in the background first that I think is key then to to getting yourself online, but a critical part of it. Good, good, good answer. That session is available, will be available, made uh, available on recordings for anyone who missed it. Lisa, I can see your hand up. Hi, yeah, so just adding to, to what Andrew said, if you're looking at um, internal kind of systems and processes <clears throat> um, and team collaboration, the things I would say of where to start is sit back and think. So similarly to the customers, it's kind of do the brainstorming, but just think about what it is you do on a daily basis at the minute so that you can see which tools are going to be the best for you. Um, because the mistake that people hopefully won't make is you just see lots of technology out there and lots of tools that say oh this is going to make your day more productive and then people go right let's do that one and then oh <clears throat> let's do this one and there are actually lots of tools that do similar things but in slightly different ways um, so I think it's that planning and just really understanding what how your business runs and what your processes are currently to see which are the right ways to go for the digital adoption to be efficient. Okay, excellent. So that, that leads us to another question that was asked. So, uh, uh, and this is quite a common uh, common issue, especially with smaller businesses, is I haven't time to do much marketing. I'm the only person in my business. How do I get over this? So I know this is a much much broader broader question as well. But what would you say, panelists? What would you? What would? How? I, I'm, a, I'm an owner operated business. So I'm doing everything. Okay. What what things can I do? I can see Rachel Dines has got a hand up there. Well, I think all of us here that have owned a small business or still do own a small business experience <laughs> that. And 
there are there are routes to cheaper and um you know easily available resource basically you know it doesn't have to be yes outsourcing is great but obviously there is a cost with that so i would say pick and choose you know what things are in, imperative that they're done correctly and in a certain way and on time and, and pay to outsource that to professionals in their field and then for the other areas you can use um Things like the Step Up Programme at the University of Sussex, which provides summer interns. You can contact the universities and see if anyone needs work experience. Some of them will actually have job boards available for those that want some work experience as part of their course. Um, and there are other options like that, you know, apprentices schemes and other things that you can bring people in, you know, minimal training because they want to work hard, prove themselves and get that experience. And then you're going to get some of those jobs done off the list. That's great. So I remember an exercise I went through when uh, you know Creative Bloom was in its uh, infancy. Is I did a pie chart of uh, I, I kept timesheets of all of the stuff I was doing, and I sat down with my business coach at the time. Said, "Well, what's the most valuable use of your time, and which bits of this, you know, can you can you get somebody else can somebody else to do and help? Because the most valuable part of your time of 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 the of the of that pie chart of those segments was you working on the business and you developing the business and you know it might have been some of the delivery as well so i'd be interested to know from uh, some of our uh, business support programs and i might be putting you on the spot here have you guys worked with any small businesses got any case studies where you've helped them get over this time issue where i'm i'm the business owner and i, I can't get through it whether it being resource or through productivity any hands up hopefully there, hopefully there is one Okay, Lisa Kerr. Hi, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> as an example, um, I worked with a business that launched quite recently, um, actually an art gallery in London, street art gallery, so far cooler than I am, <laughs> my client there. Um, and he was having exactly that problem of just having so much, <clears throat> excuse me, on his own head. He'd got a couple of staff involved and, and people helping out but just felt like he was completely overwhelmed with all the things that needed to happen. Um, and I think, as you said, Stu, it's the point of working with a business coach at that point and, and looking at either just using them to kind of dump what's in your head and usually someone looking at it from a third party perspective can instantly see where you should focus or not. Um, and then one of the tools that we use, we use two particular tools that he found helpful and has carried on to use in the business. Um, one of them is called Monday, which is a project management board um, and just meant that you could get down all the actions and allocate deadlines, allocate people to them. Um, and the other one that's something that I find quite handy is um, it's like a whiteboard, Andrew, but it's a digital whiteboard, um, which is a tool called Mindamo, where you can do um, mind mapping online. And again, you can share that amongst your team and you can allocate people's names to it um, or just to put things into those kind of chunks that you start seeing the patterns and you start to see more clearly where you need to focus um so lot, lots of things that you can do um and i think often just getting it out there getting it into some kind of tool helps with that clarity so you know where to put the time okay excellent uh gareth can you see your hand up yeah sorry i didn't didn't do it a little bit earlier i couldn't work out where my cursor was on the screen but um <laughs> Yeah, just to say with that, helping people with their productivity and digital adoption and things like that through the Invest4 grant fund, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have helped a number of people with bespoke software. And one of the ones that sort of springs to mind was a, um, a business. I think they got some like a, you know, a, a several million pound turnover and uh, they were still running everything off of Excel spreadsheets. So they needed a, a bespoke um, sort of CRM uh, system that linked in with all their other platforms and stuff as well. So, uh, you know, and they, they, they decided that once they'd reached, you know, X million pound of turnover, that was the right point to invest in the uh, bespoke CRM system. Why they didn't do it when they'd reached X hundred thousand turnover, I don't know, but it was, uh, yeah. So we supported them through that project will be ongoing because again the software developed takes a while to be done to, um to see the to, to see the results but it's just moving away from you know cumbersome spreadsheet manipulation into something that will be a lot more efficient for them to use in the future okay okay good so yeah i thought it's just important I mean, there's, there's a whole series on productivity and tools but it is important just to touch it because we've talked a lot about marketing but for all the wind world if you haven't got that productivity you haven't got that time carved out you haven't got the resources lined up to do it 
you're not going to get a headspace to be able to do it. So, so next, so one one well, another question we we, we ask we, we ask a lot as a small business or as a as a business trying to get to grips with with digital, how 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 can a small business work out? what digital channel uh, to invest in or you know so digital channel uh, do i work on my website do i work on my social media do i work more on content do i need to work on search marketing do i need to work on emailing and everything else that's in there you know do i need to be on TikTok? you know how how panel do i as a small business trying to get online work this out you know what would what would what would give me give me some give, give me some hands up okay andrew i can see your hands up might have been from the previous question but no, it's all right, it's it's up, you're going to answer this one <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think i think what's really interesting is that um it, it's often really useful in terms of any technology if you're a business is is everybody has some form of technology already in the business whether it's a an email system or a crm system or, or an account system whatever it is but by looking at where the business uses technology well, that actually helps you. So you can do a simple kind of swap matrix like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats about the tech that you've currently got. And then if you actually want to adopt any new tech to help you with marketing, you know, if you're thinking of getting into social media, then uh, the easiest way is to basically say, what is the route you want to get through to in terms of customers and what is the one area where you think technology could improve your business? And again, put that swap together. And, and in a way, it's not really much fun trying to then go browsing on Google and finding out what to do. But that's really where something like the digital champions come in is to or, or a consultant that, you know, to help you with that process to decide, is your business right for more kind of old fashioned email? Is it a new responsive website? because uh, you've got all mobile users? Is it social media? Is it TikTok? Whatever it is. Um, and I think that's a, a great way of actually looking at it. Um, and just break it down into a project. I think the, the key thing about any technology adoption is it's a bit like if you're going to build a house. The key thing is writing down your thoughts in a clear plan and a scoping document. So if you're going to put in a CRM system, you need to spec out what it is uh, you want from the system, who, which customers do you want to get to? How do you want to communicate with them? And then taking that specification and then basically farming that out to a consultant that, that can maybe help you put that technology in. Okay, thanks. And um, what, this this kind of uh, leads me into another one. Uh, might, this might be for Rachel. <laughs> is uh, One of the questions uh, was asked was, how do I even approach social media? What what channel should I be on? What platform should I be on as a, as, 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 as a local business, as a small business? Sure. Well, I mean, there's lots of articles and research online that looks at the demographics behind each platform. So you can actually see, you know, the, the age groups and the gender bias and the other types of elements that affect where you have to find your target audience. You know, once you define who your target customer is and you've got those avatars, then you can match up the channels that go with that and social media is no exclusion. You can see whether actually Facebook's going to be worth your time. It is a pretty hard slog as a business and you might need to put money into it. Um, you might have better success over on Instagram or one of the more visual platforms like, like Pinterest. So that's really where to start to figure out who you're trying to talk to and get in front of and then which platforms they're most likely to be using on a day to day. Okay, thank you. Ollie Sloan. Yeah, and I was just going to add to what Rich was saying. Um, you know, I think as soon as you're jumping on a social media platform, it's really important to know what the customer wants from you in, in, in that kind of medium. So a lot of businesses we work with, you know, you start off um, maybe making this mistake sometimes of just pr pr promoting a lot of products or just projecting a lot of what they want to say as opposed to doing the research around what the customer wants to hear and what they're going to find most valuable from those things, whether that's your imagery video if you're doing research or if it's just you know um showing a bit more of your uh, company personality i think you um it's always really important as well to really do a lot of research around the customer on those platforms and you know it helps identify the difference between what you're posting on maybe facebook versus what you might be posting on twitter because they should be different they, you should be you know um appealing to the people that you're finding on those platforms okay good yep okay so you know if i'm selling to uh you know, quantity surveyors, probably TikTok is not my traction channel. 
Right. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? So. <clears throat> Uh, a few more strategies. We're going to move. We're, we're, we're going to move on. And so, somebody asked uh, in in one of the first sessions, how important is is my website? Okay, as a as a landing point. Do I need a website? Can I use a social, uh, a Facebook page or a LinkedIn page? So this will be a uh, <laughs> an interesting question. Ollie Sloan. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, I mean, it depends massively on on what sector you're working in. Um, and I think there's a few things to kind of highlight. And, and one is your website can be used um, fantastically um, uh, if you're looking to be found online. So what I mean by that is if someone's typing um, a service or something into Google um, and you want your website to pop up, there are things you can do on your website um to encourage that to happen in terms of improving your seo practices and that kind of thing get you your search engine optimization sorted but saying that um again knowing your customer it you know are your customers the type of people who are going onto google and searching for a specific service in a specific area or are you creating a brand that is um the way your website ends up being more of almost like an online business card um, rather than something that's generating you kind of search inquiries and that kind of thing. So it, again, it's about kind of knowing um, uh, what you what you want from your website, whether it's to generate traffic and to to appear on Google, or if it's just to kind of direct people to um, maybe through kind of social channels or something like that. Okay, good, good. Rachel Dines. Yeah, just to add to that, I always say in my social media training that you shouldn't be solely reliant on third party platforms because they can disappear at any minute. Mm. You know, we've seen social channels come and go, um, new ones arriving and it's supposed to be the next big thing and then they, they don't quite make the cut. So it's always good to have something that you're in charge of, that you can put your information and your times and you can put energy into that um, being your own space and, and your front door, so to speak. Okay. We often see um, evolution of websites, uh, I suppose. Um, you know, you, you might start off with just something you've chucked up <laughs> because you're just starting out and it's a one pager. And then, it you know, it's a business card. And then it might become, oh, actually, I need something a little bit more here. I need to say what I do. or And then it starts to kind of uh, evolve out. So, you know, often... Yeah, a website is an evolutionary uh, 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 thing, I think, and something to build. And I think what the, the important thing is to work out where you are in your business and what you need it to do for you. Um, and, you know, whether you're ready to kind of invest more for it to try and work hard for you. Andrew, I mean, this is an interesting topic, Andrew. <laughs> we could probably do a whole session just on this. But what, what are your thoughts? Well, it, well, it's very interesting. I think that's a really good point, actually, Stuart, about the evolution. I mean, I, I remember back in 1998, um, I built my first website, not that I did it, because in those days you had to get a specialist to do it in horrible code. But what's really interesting in the last five years, um, if you take things like WordPress, uh, Wix and Squarespace, where you can kind of ready build, there's ready built templates to build a website. The days of having to spend, you know, five, 10, 15,000 on a website are long gone. So in actual fact, you could easily redevelop um, exactly what Rachel said, which is like just a sort of standard page that you maybe had 10 years ago into a pretty decent site that looks fantastic on all devices, fully responsive, uh, has lots of good content and media in it um, for just a couple of thousand pounds. In fact, you know, if you do it yourself in Wix and Squarespace, something like that, about 500 pounds. But there are three th things about any website, though, which are really important. Uh, content has always been absolutely critical. So somebody who can, uh, if you're not good at writing content, who can help you write that content, get your message across succinctly. Uh, secondly is obviously the design but again a lot of that has gone out of the way now because it's ready built in templates which is great um, and the third part is media um, because I think uh, the days of just having a few pictures in a site again are kind of gone and you do need to use things like good high, high quality images and video a lot more as well uh, even if it's doing your own kind of mini video blog so so refreshing your content constantly these days even if it's a cheap site uh, is absolutely key. Okay, good one. I just interested to know our business support organisation is grant funding available for website projects. Anyone like to answer? 
Yeah, uh, uh, I'd yeah. have to answer that. Yeah, we, we do support website projects. So uh, through the Invest4 grant fund, uh, we can support revenue costs as well as capital costs. So quite a lot of our revenue projects that um, small businesses have applied for have been for uh, redevelopment of websites, marketing consultancy, uh, branding and all those sort of associated things that go go together with it all so um we have a minimum project size of five thousand pounds so if you're going to an agency to get a um a, you know a, a high impact website done you could be looking at around about that sort of money anyway so um yeah we can support web development projects through the invest for grant fund okay that's really good to know it's good for us agencies to know as well we <laughs> kind we're, of we're trying to get the word out yeah steer <laughs> people through you okay so agencies if you're on yeah, there we go. You get money off your fees. Uh, Karen? <laughs> yeah, um, just to also add into what Gareth was saying, that some of the local districts and boroughs and local authorities also run ad hoc grant schemes. I know that Aaron have got one running at the moment that um, funds going, getting online, so new websites as well as upgrading um, your current ones. So it's always worthwhile signing up to their um, business email newsletters to hear what grant funding comes out as and when, as soon as it's launched. That's a great tip. I mean, we always talk about the website being a bit of an elephant in the room in digital marketing. It's like, you know, for all we can bring all the traffic to you as we could, but the website's not quite up to scratch. Ooh, okay. So um, I'm going to move on to uh, an interesting category, brand. Okay, so we did one of the sessions we did was on brand. And uh, it, one of the questions that came out was, you know, should... Should, should a company have a brand? What, 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 what's the value of having a brand or a mission? You know, do, do I actually need one? Isn't it just me and some colours and a logo? So it'd be interesting to get a view from uh, one of our one of our panelists on this. If I can see a hand up, or our views on brand, the power of brand for businesses. Uh, Rachel, I can see your hand isn't up, but I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> you, you let our brand <laughs> I didn't put my hand up. Otherwise, because... otherwise, we're going to have 30 seconds of the silence. <laughs> That's fine. I didn't I put my hand up because now. everyone's heard from me on this already. And I thought someone else might like to say something. <laughs> However, um, yes, all businesses can have a brand. It, we're not having to uh, aim to be the Coca-Cola's of this world, um, but branding is more than just a logo. You know, it, it's the whole kind of essence of the business and actually what your values are and where you want to take the business and what your internal kind of um, environment is like. And, you know, even down to who you hire, and why you hire them and how they fit in with, with your business and, and your goals. Um, so, yes, the answer is yes. Okay, good, good. Anyone, anyone else want to talk about brand, the importance of brand or any brand examples? They think they've, they've seen a good, good practice recently. If not, we can move on to the next section. Okay. So, okay. Um, again, you know, uh, Ollie. <laughs> I was too slow. It's because I can't put my hand up as a co-host. So I have to do like an applause thing. Oh, it right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we've all got That's that. why I'm just applauding. Oh, you're just applauding me. <laughs> well, I was just getting an applause. The only thing I was going to add on the end is, is, is kind of brand consistency. And that's kind of, if you're going to put yourself out there in multiple areas, um, it's really important to try start to establish, you know, what is your kind of brand voice? Uh, you know, what are your guidelines? How do you want to, you know, appear? Because, um, you know, people, if you're going to put yourself out there, depending on where people find you, it's it, it can be like just as confusing and and kind of to your detriment if it if your brand is confused, your language is changing, people throughout your organisation aren't all clear on how you present yourself and what you say and your and your language and that kind of thing. So I was just going to add that being consistent with your brand, wherever you are out there on your website, social media, even when you, even your kind of, uh, you know, quick pitch, um, yeah, consistency is really important. Definitely. Okay, thank you. Okay, Andrew. I, a very cool one, actually. It's, um, I, I, I was looking the other day at the very, the world's very first brand, apparently it was, it was Pear Soap in 1780. Um, but it's interesting that, um, as Ollie says, and Rachel's also covered extensively in the course that, that she ran the workshop, um, you really obviously need to integrate your brand as well with your kind of vision and mission and key unique selling points as well, because um, you've got to get a consistent message across, as Ollie says, to your customers. Um, so having that vision of what you want to deliver as a company, that mission you communicate to your customers, then obviously the brand and the any slogan that goes with that has to actually match all together. So that's all consistency to key. Yeah. Okay, excellent, excellent. NASA. 
Uh, yeah, I just think uh, one one brand that stands out in a very crowded market, and they've been very successful, and it's worth having a look and even you know, having a dialogue with with them is Rich View Wines. Um, it is by far the most successful brand in a very crowded sparkling English sparkling wine uh, market space. Um, and they they uh, this in the next well over the next two weeks have captured the COP26 wine. Uh, delivery. Uh, they're servicing, serving the um, their what brand of wine now. Oh. Uh, I think that would be a very good uh, example, and even potentially trying to get um, uh, one of the guys there to speak it because they they've they've captured that market and they make a very strong brand case. Brilliant. Okay, I've got great case study. And Lisa, final one on brand. We're going to move on. Uh, thanks, Stuart. It was actually a follow up to those same panel members as, as you're on that topic of. Um, you mentioned about having different audiences and different kind of channels. Mm -hmm. I'm just interested in how you guys would say that works in terms of if you're using, say, Instagram, TikTok and LinkedIn because you're appealing to different audiences on each. How do you keep that consistency? So you've got your brand identity, but your language presumably would differ between those. That's a great, difficult question. Rachel Downs. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, actually, it, it shouldn't be that vastly different. You know, yes, yeah. you might be using different platforms, but your brand voice and, and the, the whole essence of your brand is the same wherever that's going out. And, you know, that goes back to Ollie's comment about consistency. It's really about just adapting that to be the right kind of voice for the platforms. You know, you might be doing something differently on TikTok to LinkedIn, you know, and, and it doesn't mean that it's, that it's like a completely different thing. It's just, you know, an adaptation of it. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, okay, brilliant. Okay, so one of the sections we, we talked about uh, a lot in, the, in, in this series was the use of technology for marketing. Okay, so what, what I think we've seen is certainly in the last, 18 months or so, the increase of technology, you know, digital technology and other technology that we're using in marketing has skyrocketed. So, you know, uh, a lot of businesses suddenly have, to, uh, we, we had an amazing case study from uh, the Artisan Bakery uh, who went from an offline business to an online business. And now that has its own challenges in the form of security and data and it was a little bit of a murky, murky world. Joe, I know we've got Joe, our, our security expert on, on the call. It'd just be good to, how, how have you seen, I guess, the differences in, in the last 18 months that businesses have had to get their heads around, even approaching, how do I use and handle data? What, what is data security? What should I be doing about it? Well, I mean, it's, it's a huge kind of minefield. So, um, it's, it's getting the basics right. It's for you as the business owner and any of your staff, your um, subcontractors, your freelancers, making sure they're doing the basics. Um, are they sort of using secure passwords? Um, are they protecting themselves with um, firewalls, antivirus, malware? Um, it's it's really interesting that people think there's a lot that they have to do when really it's the basics that they're missing. And um, I watched a um, program with an ethical hacker the other day. And, you know, I, I do this stuff all the time. And some of the stuff he said, even I learned stuff from, for example, um, he showed a case study where somebody had looked from a room across the road and he was able to zoom in to the computer screen and look at the emails. And he actually had pictures and he said, you know, I'm sort of a mile across the road kind of thing or half a mile or whatever. And he could really zoom in and that's called over your shoulder. Now, that sounds quite extreme, but you put that into a small business owner who's working in the cafe or working in a co-working site where you don't know people, people can look over your shoulder at any point and just see your data. 
Um, so it's not always those big, scary things that you need to think about. It's going back to basics and putting in some fundamental protections. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's a difference between, you know, you suddenly could derail your entire business. And if you've worked yeah. hard to build this online presence, suddenly, yeah. you know, you have a malware attack or a data yeah. breach or you report to the ICO, yeah. you know, that could, that could, that could, that could collapse your business. Well, it could certainly certainly pause on it. It's just right. It's really important that you, you do absolutely know this stuff. So that starts to lead us kind of into where we're talking about, you know, what actually data am I, what data am I starting to capture here? And, you know, one of the sessions we had was on the visitor economy. And we started mm -hmm. talking about the tools that are available uh, to be able to to be able to to to, to capture data and and why why we would want to use it and um, you know one of the things that came out and we, I guess we talked about you know is is the, is the concept of a marketing funnel and how you actually capture data at different points and then use that data to be able to market to but would any, as any of our uh, panelists like to uh, uh, share an, an interesting example of of technology that helps enable a business to i guess to be able to market it more effective effectively into any kind of sector that helps automate what they do a bit or helps just you know power power their marketing a little bit more tumbleweeds <laughs> I, I can happily talk about what i do um i use email marketing and you know i take it from a lead magnet on my website and various other things. Um, but also, don't forget that you've got your existing clients and you can continue marketing to them without the need to kind of double your efforts, double your money. They're already a fan of yours because they're buying your service. Market to them. And you don't need any additional permissions. They've purchased from you. So bring them into your marketing world and keep them informed about what's going on in your business. It's, you know, I, I, one of the things that I learned very quickly, and I'm not a marketer, is that it costs you less in time and money to market and upsell and cross-sell to your existing customers than it does in time, effort, and money to chase after the new customers. And using the kind of GDPR rules, you can, legitimately market to your existing client base without any effort. Brilliant. That's Joe. Thanks for, thanks for answering my really long question. <laughs> I had everyone a little bit, what's he asking me? Uh, brilliant. Okay. And uh, Ollie Sloan, you had your, had your hand up there. Yeah, I was just, I just wanted to kind of um, elaborate a little bit on what Joe was saying and, and also just kind of hark back a little bit to anyone who came on that session, the visitor economy session, where we talked about data. Um, and how, um, you know, as you touched on, you know, there's different points in this in this user journey from when people first meet you and what and the types of things they're typing into Google to find your service or product to when people are already engaged with you and you can ask them, you know, how they found you, you know, why they, you know, if they'd recommend you to their, you know, whenever you start kind of buying products now, you're getting questions like, would you recommend us? Can you complete a, sh a short three question survey? And what this is, is this is, businesses trying to collect just that little bit more data mm -hmm. so that over time they're painting a really clear picture you know if you if you've been a, a, a regular customer with someone for a year you'll have over time give them loads of information which helps them better market to you because in the end what people want is if if they're receiving your marketing they want it to be targeted and they don't want they don't want to receive things they're not interested in about so um, as long as obviously you're uh, going along with, you know, GDPR guidelines of being safe with things, you can collect data and the value of it is you can increase your conversion rates, yeah. increase the number of people buying things because you're giving them much more targeted, relevant information um, in your emails and in your uh, you know, remarketing ads and that kind of thing. So um, it's definitely something to maybe later down the line really start to kind of work out how you what you can implement in, ter in terms of your data capture okay so uh, uh tom thomas who's uh on on the on the uh session with us has asked does that mean you can message existing customers even if they didn't specifically opt into an email newsletter this is your favorite question joe <laughs> 
<clears throat> the very short, very quick, dirty answer is yes. Um, <laughs> the slightly longer but less detailed answer is using the legal basis for um, marketing and, and data usage is legitimate interest. These people are your fans. They've paid um, <clears throat> for your services. So there is a legitimate interest in assuming that they would want to know more about your business, more about your services. Um, so yes, feel free to include them on your newsletter list. The caveat to this is I would make sure that your business terms and conditions and, um, you know, the, the kind of contracts that you have with your customers, make it clear that as part of being a customer, you will include them on your marketing list. And it's pretty standard now, but um, all email marketing tools will offer subscribers the opportunity to unsubscribe if they don't want to hear from you. So, so long as that is in place and so long as you've been transparent and so long as your existing customers, when you class your existing customers, don't suddenly go back five years and decide that they are existing customers. It, you need to think carefully about what an existing customer is. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Andrew, you've got, a, you've got a, a point on this question. Yeah, it's a very interesting one. It's actually uh, down to coast to capital. Um, so when <laughs> the COVID pandemic first hit, which would have been about <laughs> April last year, um, Coast to Capital was debating internally, um, given they launched a special grant um, to help businesses, even buy things like laptops, for example, to keep going and working from home, could they actually contact their entire database about this new grant scheme? Um, and exactly as Joe said, uh, the conclusion was yes, due to legitimate interest. So I actually did ring the Information Commission's office to check on this, and they absolutely confirmed that. So because you were offering grants to businesses in distress, yes. and you had them on your database, it, it was absolutely legitimate to say, yeah. would you like a grant? Here's an application form. But, yeah. but it is all about then, um, as Joe said, about opting out when you communicate, but also opting in. So, so if they're not on your full opt-in list, then that's also a good opportunity with that legitimate interest to say, would you like a grant? And by the way, would you like some more information from us as well? Tick yeah. the relevant boxes. So yes. that definitely helped. <laughs> We've been waiting since July, so it's been quite a journey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so that, that's, that, that, that leads us a little bit into uh, having to balance different types of customers. And uh, Sam Watkins asked on the, on the customers session, how 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 should how should she balance? She she, she served corporate, very corporate uh, uh, customers, but also she sold to individuals, business to consumer as well. How does a small bit? How does a business manage that different messaging around its messaging, around its digital assets, around you know the resources, the things they're putting out, around what's on the website, around their use of social media? Uh, how, have you got any tips, panelists, for 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 Sam Watkins? I think you might need to clarify the question there. <laughs> how, how can a small business balance, say, co very corporate messaging versus in messaging for individuals, say, B2C, okay. with, their, with their marketing? So I can have a go at answering that. Um, one really good way to do this is to actually, like, kind of interview or speak to your customers and listen to the language that they use. That kind of very low level market research can reveal some amazing gems about the things that they searched for to find you, uh, the problems that they were having before you helped them, uh, the kind of terminology that, that they refer to you using. And all of those kinds of things can be valuable because then you can start to build up the, the kind of dictionary, I guess, to, to speak to your customers in the language that will completely resonate with them. You don't feel like you have to describe something in the way that a big corporate does. You know, use your own take on it and speak in a language that will resonate with your customers. Okay, good. Thanks. Ollie. Yeah, so, um, and also just um, following on from what Rach was saying, um, you know, when 
with, with your website, for example, and even with your, your marketing, you know, you, you, you can immediately segment these customers actually quite easy, um, easily, you know, using different, like what we call a landing page, which just means the first page someone views on your website. And you can, through, you know, with your emails, you can have two different lists. So you've got your corporate clients and you've got your B2C um, and the B2C people go to the, the, the landing pages that are going to be more suitable for them and vice versa. So you're immediately trying to segment these different groups of people into um, to groups so that you'll give them a better user experience. Essentially, when they land on your website, they feel like they're in the right place. The corporate clients feel like the information is correct for them and vice versa. So it's about kind of spending a little bit of time if we're talking about your website, you know, really looking at the structure of it and thinking if you do have those two completely different customer lists, how can you structure the website to incorporate that um, to kind of tend to both, you know, both parties. Excellent. And, and you know, and the homepage is important, how you split off those two audiences. The purpose of your homepage, uh, explaining what you do, who you do it for, and to get, if you've got different audiences, get them off the homepage and into deeper content where you want them to take the action. Lisa. Just a small point to add, um, and ties in with what Rachel was saying there, um, thinking about the language is the difference between clients and customers. So quite often it's to, if you're doing B2B, you talk about clients. And if you're doing B2C, you talk about customers. So even just the small things, and, and I noticed you guys were doing it there as well, like Ollie, Ollie says corporate clients. But, and then you say, if you're speaking to your customers, so it's just tiny things like that make that difference. Um, because at the end of the day, it's the same person, your customer is your client, whether, what, you know, sometimes someone who's buying as a customer, also is the decision maker in that corporate. But I think we as individuals also have that different mindset when we're doing something on behalf of a business or when we're doing something ourselves. So we use different language about ourselves. Um, so yeah, let's listen, listen to how people talk and think about those distinctions and build that in. Yep, that's great, great, great advice. So that leads us a little bit um, into <clears throat> into uh, starting to think about you know, uh, the channels and the marketing tactics that we're going to start employing to, to, re to reach our customers. And we talked about um, marketing funnels, okay? So, you know, uh, the, you know it, and, and, and Joe touched upon this brilliantly, you know, it's much harder to win new customers than to market to your existing customers. So, Let's say, so well, let's break this down a little bit. So, you know, in a kind of uh, awareness and consideration stage where you're trying to get noticed by customers, either get them to notice you as part of a, a mature market or get them to educate them on, on something that's new. What are the tools, what are the marketing tools and tactics, channels, anything that are available to, to, to small and local businesses to be able to get more people into that top of the funnel, into the pipe? Ollie Sloan. I mean, um, yeah. So, I mean, if we're starting from you know small businesses up, it's it it's massive. Essentially, there's so many different. You know, what we touched on earlier is is you need to be where your customers are. So, firstly, so it's about noticing. Um, you know, a, a, a lot of businesses say, you know, oh, there's five social media channels, I need to be on all five. But it's not. It's not true. It's about being on the one where that your customers are in. But also, this is, you know, where we start talking about things like paid advertising, people think, you know, quite quickly, oh, you know, I want to do, I want to try some paid advertising because Google sent me 75 pounds of free credit and I've already set it up, but hooked up my credit card and now I'm spending my own money, you know. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, but with, with something like paid advertising, a lot of people want to jump on it, but it's really important to, as we say, be really targeted with what you're doing. Um, and there are other ways that you can start setting yourself up to get awareness before you start throwing money at it. For example, if we're talking about local businesses, even um, typing your service in your location into Google, you start to see um, wh whatever pops up above your uh, website result could be an opportunity for you to get found. So we might be talking about even like directories, even getting on review websites, even, you know, listing yourself on um, yeah, you know, third party websites and also those little um, what we call local map packs. So having your Google My Business page in place and starting to build like the correct foundations and doing everything that you can do, which is free to get yourself found is really the first place to start and cover all those bases. 
Um, and then you can start looking at, you know, in your reporting, if any of those are working for you, if you're starting to get any traction, which of them um, is, you know, is, is bringing you new traffic or returning traffic. Um, and you can either do more of that, or if you're still struggling, then you might want to think about, you know, um, other ch other angles. But do what you can for uh, for free first, I would say. Okay, brilliant. Okay, Rachel. Yeah, and I think alongside that, the the key thing is to actually offer value. You know, if you're trying to share your knowledge and expertise, trying to teach people things, trying to just give something extra, you know, that often will resonate with those people and, and, and bring them in your in your direction rather than just kind of being outward all the time you know that kind of giving will definitely help you earn the trust and awareness from new people yeah it's not it's not called buy my stuff media is it it's called social media clue, <laughs> exactly. clue, clue. Yeah, two way <laughs> <laughs> great uh zoe hi yeah I was just um, just wanted to flag up the business IP centres. So Brighton has one, um, and Crawley have just have just got one as well, and they've got amazing market research resources. Um, some of them you can access. Um, I think a couple of them are just online. But you, the rest of them, they're very diverse. Absolutely fantastic to be able to research, um, you know, businesses in the local area to you in different sectors. Um, and you know, you can you can go down there and. Um, in person to use those use those resources or some of them as I said are online via their portal so I can put the link in in the chat yep. for the Brighton one. Thank you. Okay. Yeah that's a great, great thing to highlight Zoe. Um, I'm actually one of the experts in residence for the Brighton one and they run online webinars and sessions and you can also book one-to-one -one online appointments as well so that's a really valuable resource. Okay good stuff okay so the, the, the topic of technology came up came up a lot in you know in 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 the sessions and we just started talking about you know some, some of the channels as well but as you start getting further down your marketing funnel you know and we're talking about starting to capture data as we've you know we've got them in that to that first bit technology can really really boost your marketing efforts and, and your sales and your productivity on it so what so we talk about uh, being able to retain customers or market to our existing customers. And there's a variety of technology available to small businesses. Has anyone got a view on the technology available that, cost, that, 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 that businesses can use to help retain or engage with their customers and anything that they've used or anything that they would recommend? Hopefully I see a hand up. Okay, uh, Ollie Sloan. Richard and I are probably going to be talking about the same thing. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I just um, just wanted to obviously, you know, talk further about we've got, you know, mailing lists, which most of us are already doing. So, but tr trying to kind of um, manage your mailing list as much as you can. So making sure that you're actually giving them, a, um, if people aren't opening them, making sure you're jumping in there and, and, and have a look around. But, but what we talked about before was um, what we call remarketing, which is when someone comes to your website and then you can you can market them afterwards. And, and the benefit of that is um, uh, it is a paid for service essentially. So you're you're paying for someone to click on your ad still, but um, whereas you know um, some marketing efforts are costing a few pounds a click, this is this is more in the range of like twenty pence, thirty pence per click because they're they're already in your marketing list and you're not essentially competing. Um, for that customer because they're already a customer of yours um, and so the the benefit of something like remarketing is particularly for as an e example e-commerce companies you know um, a lot of people leaving the funnel so if they're if maybe putting something in their basket and then they see the delivery cost is a little bit more than they expect and they leave your website you could then remarket them with uh, a discount for shipping um, and that kind of thing so just an example of you can use remarketing quite cleverly to um, either increase your conversions um, or, you know, offer people who, who maybe haven't been on your website for a while an incentive to come back. Um, and that's, you know, what we said again, using the people that you already have on your list from, that are already in your funnel as opposed to trying to pull them in the top again, which is much, much harder and much, takes a lot more time. 
Yeah. It's that it's that dark art of following people around the internet a little bit. You might have you yeah. might have seen it. So <laughs> so so through Google. But they're, they're, that's the, the environment where we've 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 been asked to play in by Google. So. And just on that, just Gareth just said, um, is that similar to a Facebook pixel? So Facebook pixels for Facebook advertising, um, and this and you would need to install something on your website for uh, this is for Google. I was I was being, I was. Um, talking about and this is where you could appear on other websites around the web but so it's it's a similar principle but it's, it's a, a different principle. channel exactly. yeah yeah so it's called remarketing so uh being able to market to anonymously we are told joe <laughs> i suppose you could do a whole session on the uh, gdpr of uh, of remarketing but it is all uh, it, it, it is all technically legit i believe and uh, well i hope it is because <laughs> uh, m- most uk marketers will use it but you know someone who's had an interaction with one of your digital assets if if the if the opt-ins are correct um set up rightly on your website at lend lead on you can then follow someone around the internet a little bit through their through their user journey is that is that right joe or did i get that right in terms of that summary or Sorry, I got called, but I've just had a call from the school about my son. Right, don't worry, don't worry, we'll move on. Ask me the question again, I'm sorry. Don't worry. But- We'll move. We'll move on. We'll move on. We'll see. We could have. I'm we could have spent a whole, a whole. Sorry, we could have spent a whole session talking about that. Uh, Lisa, I can see your hand up. Yes. So, um, talking about tech to retain customers as well as the yeah. marketing side of it, um, you can also use things like having the information. So, but as Rachel said, having information on your website. Um, the kind of the how-to guides about products or information that they might find useful um, and also using the technology and systems and processes internally just to make sure that you keep all of that information kind of in a clear place so if you have a current customer contact you about something that you're not thinking oh god which book did I put that detail in or where on earth do Mm -hmm. I find that so having it's not all just about the external facing but having all your internal systems and processes running really efficiently will mean that you can provide a better service a better after service to Mm -hmm. your customers as well yeah great stuff okay Andrew Um, that fits in perfectly with what Lisa just said an extension to that in that Uh, everybody effectively is a salesperson on behalf of the company. Uh, And one of the things we've all found um, since the pandemic came in is that we've had some good examples of pretty appalling customer service where we've rung somebody up or we've contacted somebody and and they've no idea what's going on with our query or anything to do with an order or whatever it is. So there is some simple stuff. I mean, it's, it's as Lisa says really is, is having your data in one place. You know, if you've got a CRM system, making sure it's mm-hmm. integrated with the latest data. Um, things like Office 365, you know, everybody's got a mobile phone and for about 18 quid a month, you know, you can have all that information about your customers, your contacts, your CRM, all that at your fingertips quite easily. Um, and basically it just means that you always appear like you're on it at all times. And it just makes you appear much better to your customers, regardless of what you're doing, I think. Okay, excellent. So uh, CRMs, we've not scratched that itch too much in this mm. session. So uh, for, for, for anyone who doesn't know that word, uh, cust- customer relationship management software, is that right? Good okay, guess, so- <laughs> <laughs> well, That was close. Um, so what, what is a CRM? Uh, how, do, how, do, how can we use it in marketing? What can it do for us? Let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's see a panellist. I can see Lisa kind of um, wanting to answer this question only because she's looking at me. What's it? What's a typical CRM, uh, Lisa? <laughs> um, I'd actually say probably one of the marketers are the best ones to answer on on the CRMs. Um, <clears throat> so it's a system, um, as with other systems, that it keeps all the data about your customers in one place. Um, there are various CRMs, quite a lot of CRMs out there, and some have more functionality than others. Um, you can get free ones as with pretty much all software there's kind of free versions and then there are more advanced versions that you pay for Um, but you can use a CRM to allocate tasks for example and you can also link them through to your email box Um, so every time you send an email or receive an email that can be logged automatically through to your CRM so that it logs it against those customer records so that you're not kind of following through thinking oh I need to search my sent folder or I need to search this or that it, you can integrate all of that so it keeps all of the information about your customers in one place and you can use it to create deal flows to do your kind of prospect generation 
um, and I believe it's not something I do a lot of, so pass over to the marketers here, um, that you can also integrate them to do your direct um, mailings from yeah. there. Okay. That's absolutely right. Per that was a great answer, Lisa. What are you talking about? <laughs> so let's have let's hear from one of the marketers. Ollie, I did see your hand up there when talking about CRMs. What would we use a CRM for for for, for marketing to customers and and and, and why? Um, I think I was going to um, just ex expand a little bit on what Lisa was saying. Exactly, um, um, uh, exactly right. Essentially, what, what's what's really handy is if you already have a lot of information about um, you know customers offline. Taking it online into a CRM makes everything so much um, quicker to access. Um, you're creating this customer persona. Um, so you're starting to, like we're saying, do, you know, um, learn more about your customers. And it's all in one place. And everyone can access it really, really easily. But also when we start talking about marketing, um, automation also becomes really relevant. And this is about starting to automate the, um, uh, you know, marketing that you're doing. For example, emails. You're sending out, uh, you know, an offer. If someone doesn't open it three within three days later, it'll automate. You know, you've already set up the following one to go out. So it's starting to take care of the process and and reduce the amount of time you have to spend on it. So um, obviously, the cost of these CRMs range massively depending on the size of business you or the size of your marketing list. Um, so it's important to to um, you know utilize one that's going to be relevant for what you're doing. But there are a load of free ones out there. Um, but the the automation and taking your time out of it, really knowing a lot more about your customers, having everything in one place, easy to access. Um, it's definitely something that for any business growing, something that you need to eventually move towards. Um, and also the last thing is a lot of those CRMs can incorporate, can pull in the information from all of your uh, marketing channels. So it can pull in all your social media information or the email or the Facebook stuff. Um, you know, everything to do your website, your payment gateways. So you're starting to take all of the information you've got about your website and your um, sales, and it's all going to be in one location and, and a nice, easy to read dashboard. So, um, yeah. Okay, that leads us quite nicely into the topic of measurement. Okay, so, you know, we've talked a little bit around strategy. We've talked a little bit about brand in this session. So I'll start talking about digital channels. But how do I know what's working? All right. So, you know, the topic of 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 measurement. So, you know, one of the questions asked was, what, where's the best place for me to measure my, my digital marketing? Have we got, uh, here we go, Ollie Sloan. <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> perfectly that was lined detail, up. Wasn't that it? Was, yeah, wasn't it? it's, like, it's like we planted that one, we didn't. Yeah. But <laughs> um, I mean, we've all, so again, hopefully um, some of you came on the, the session that Stu ran on um, talking about kind of reporting and, and uh, specifically talking about Google Analytics. Um, the reason we always shout about Google Analytics is because it's a free tool that essentially tells you what's going on on, on your website. Um, and it's kind of a no brainer for any business to start off with at least. Um, there are a lot of tools, you know, if you have Square, Squarespace that has its own analytics tool, um, there are even some you can pull in for WordPress, but um, essentially knowing what, you know, being able to report, there's no point putting all this time into SEO. Well, there might be, but it's much more valuable put, if you're going to put time into SEO and, and advertising and marketing, if you can actually, after three months, after six months, look at which of those marketing efforts worked, which of those actually gave you conversions? Why did you get 10 form fills? Where, you know, which channel did they come from? Which even um, advert did people click on to, to kind of get them to that point? Um, and only through having kind of implementing something like Google Analytics um, allows you to do that and actually allows you to go back and look through, you know, where people came from, demographic information, you know, the time of day when, when you should be posting your um, emails out, your social, you get loads of information that you wouldn't otherwise have. So, um, it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's something that absolutely has to be kind of employed by everyone. Um, and what and uh, and and panel, what should we be measuring? You know, what do we think that you know we should be measuring? You know, it was one of the key questions. What do I measure? You know, what what am I actually looking at? Because I think a lot of people can go into the Google Analytics or the social dashboards and uh, what am I actually what am I actually uh, trying to measure? Rachel, it does relate to your goals. So obviously, if we're talking about social media, you know, you want to try and avoid the vanity metrics and actually look at where the people are converting you know are they clicking through are they engaging with your content 
if we're talking about, um, you know, perhaps lead magnets or an action that's on your website, then analytics is the perfect place to see how people are getting to your website in the first place, how long they're spending on there, what actions they're taking and whether they complete. And if they don't complete, actually, at what stage are they dropping out of that process? You know, perhaps it's all simply down to the language on the page um, that's, that's losing them at that point. You know, there are tests that can be done, A-B testing and other things that you can factor in to, to work out what the problem is there and improve those conversion rates. And the data will help you with that. Okay, thank you. Ollie? Yeah, and I just wanted to, um, so v Vicky was messaging me in the chat about Google Analytics, so I thought it just relevant that I just um, added this on to, to this conversation that um, essentially, you know, um, analytics is a little bit of, um, how to install it is there's a little bit of code that you put on your website. So in Vicky's case, a developer's um, done this for her, so you might be getting a developer to do it. However, she doesn't want that person to have access anymore. Um, and if you're ever in that situation, you can always just remove the code that's on there and make a new one and set up a, a new analytics account. Um, so it's, um, again, analytics is just looking at what's going on. There's nothing that you can mess up. You're just kind of looking at the data, trying to get some information. Um, but in, in, in your case, Vicky, um, either the person should give you access, so it should, should give you full administrator access, or if they really, if you're really struggling to get them to do that, you can get someone to take their code off the website and set up a new one for you. Um, but uh, hopefully it should be um, a straightforward process for you. Okay, thank you, good stuff. Andrew. Um, well, this, this is an interesting one. Obviously lots of times when you're marketing, you're trying to get to thousands and thousands of people at one time to sell big products. If you're actually on the B2B world, it may be that you've got just two or three people within one company you want to get to. So there are um, various platforms out there, platforms, for example, like Lead Forensics, where you can send an email out to a known email address of that particular person you want to contact. There's then a piece of code within the email that links into the platform that effectively then shows you when that person actually goes onto your website and individual web pages. So uh, we've heard before about other systems that allow you to track through when people look at things on a particular web page, this tracks that person and it's GDPR compliant because it actually matches the IP address of the device that they're using and matches that with the email. So you can also then see in the future when they go back to your web page and when they go back to your website. So you can see, for example, if your email marketing is working and then, of course, you can pick the right time to give them a call to potentially sell and pitch to them. So there's some quite sophisticated stuff you can do with tracking analytics as well. Brilliant stuff. And, uh, you know, there's another example of how you use technology to automate your marketing and make it more effective and, uh, you know, just get it all working together. Karen. Yes, I just wanted to add in a, um, to Advocate Lead Forensics, actually, particularly if you're in the B2B market space. So in a previous life, I had that analytics on my website um, and it was really interesting to see the relationship that you built with potential clients from the very first contact that they have with your website um, to all the way through the sales process and hopefully when they sign up for your product or service. So would highly recommend that product. Okay, okay, brilliant. Okay, we're gonna go, uh, we've got time for just a couple more, couple more of the attendee questions and then we are gonna do a panel wrap up. Panel wrap up, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists just to give us a key takeaway for all of, all of, all of the viewers who are gonna be watching this. What's your key thing? that somebody should do when embarking on a marketing journey? It can be you know, anything about channel or strategy, but kind of give you a little bit of time to prepare it, prepare it on your head. So um, we, we did talk a lot uh, around customers and the customer journey within, um, within one of our sessions. And uh, one, of the, one of the questions was, uh, Someone, someone was asking how they would get better at segmenting their customers. Okay, so how would I actually go about, you know, working out how to work out who my customers are? Um, so let's give a few tips from the panel about how how can a business approach that? You know, if they've got you know quite a diverse. I think Thomas said he's got quite a diverse a diverse set. How do you actually even market to them? How do you start creating those those different messaging? How do we approach customer segmentation? 
I can put my hand up. <laughs> Go for okay. it. You don't you June, don't sorry. It's June, yes. Yeah, I answered the up. question. You're all thinking about your key takeaway, aren't you? Okay, so I would start with, uh, you know, so you've either got an idea of, of, of who they are, okay? And what you've got to do is work out what basis of segmentation you are going to use. So am I going to segment on, you know, if it's B2B type of sector or type of individual or, you know, some kind of demograph or region or size of business, et cetera. It might be a bit of a mixture, a bit of a mixture. But once you've kind of got that in your head, if you can't get to that point, just start writing down your customers, okay? Or clients <laughs> and then start putting like okay what are the what are the attributes to this person or this client okay so you know b2b might be the, the business the sector the region the size of business etc um you know for b2c B, uh, customers could be you know uh, affluent household in surrey blah blah, blah 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 and then you start to be able to build that picture of your different uh customer segments and from there you can start to go right, okay well which ones are kind of similar in their needs and motivations and you start to group them together because those are the ones who are going to respond to those sorts of those sorts of marketing messages to, to, to a particular marketing message and that's how you can manage distinct customer segments so, you know when you start to pull that into your crm and this, this did have a link it wasn't just a random question when you start to pull this into your crms you can segment your CRMs into those lists as well. So you say, actually, I can only, I want to market a, a certain, I sort of got my hands all over the camera, uh, a certain, a certain marketing campaign or messaging, and you can automate it through your CRMs to a certain segment, which is why it's really important. So I guess um, <laughs> my key takeaway, and I'm going to go first, okay, is that one of the most important areas for you to spend on as a small business is your customers okay spend some time segmenting it spend some time making sure you've profiled them you know their motivations and pain points and you've got that very clear and then you can use that throughout the rest of your marketing and then it's just working out what channels what content and what's working and what's not so that is that is my that is my key my key takeaway uh, for the panel so i'm going to go around the houses here i can see rachel I knew you'd pick on me first. I would, because you were smiling. I'll forgive you. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, just the first thing is is work out what you want to achieve. So important. You know, you can't you can't do any of the other things. You can't work out what you're going to use, uh, what's working, how much money to put into it, and everything else if you don't know what you want to achieve. Thank you. Okay, Ollie Sloan, what's your key key takeaway from our series? My key takeaway is um, something I like to say a lot when 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 businesses ask me the question, why is my website not ranking? Um, and that is for, for me to say that, um, are you being honest with yourself in terms of whether you deserve to rank? And what I mean by that is, you know, take a look at the actual search environment, have a look at your competitors, do a bit of research and be really honest. Look, you know, deep, go, go deep dive into their content. And um, what you might find is whether it's, you know, better categorization or people go into a lot more detail, you know, some businesses, you know, a lot of these blogs we see now and articles are so, so long because it's all about being an expert on your topic. So I would say, is, you know, do the research and be really honest and say, you know, do I deserve to rank? And if not, um, why not? And then do whatever you can, you know, use your competitors to your advantage, do try and employ some of the tactics that they're doing that are working. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, Joe. So what would I say, key takeaway, use marketing, <clears throat> but use it wisely, protect your data, and most importantly, get the basics of data protection in, because if you get the basics in, you're less likely to have a problem, and you're less likely to have to phone the ICO and tell them you've got a problem. Okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, so I'll just run around the digital champions and then... Uh key takeaway call to action from them and um, also from our business support organization. So Andrew, key takeaway for call to action for marketing, I, customers and marketing. I, I think the one thing that people forget is the most valuable asset to a business is its staff. So yes. make them more productive. Um, you can do this in lots of different ways. They've all got a smartphone. So make sure that smartphone can talk to all the other tech and business information you've got. Things like Microsoft 365, they can all then do video calling. They've got that security built in. 
potentially links to your CRM system if you've got one, uh, and basically help them to help you improve your business and be more productive and sell more and market better. Okay, lovely. Uh, Lisa? Thanks. Um, I'd repeat everything Andrew says about process, um, so won't repeat that. Um, but my my top tip on marketing actually is that I'm not a marketeer. I'm all about systems and processes. But I've learned so much from all of you guys on this series and on this session from those of you who are the marketeers. So my top tip for everyone is to take up the digital champion support, get in touch with these guys who are running the webinars, because um, actually there's so much information out there. And I have learned absolutely loads myself for my business through this series. There you go. Top tip. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Gareth, call to action, business hothouse. Clearly, my first call to action would be apply for a grant to help you with your digital uh, transformation within your business. But um, yeah, a absolutely. You know, as everyone has said, you know, the UK lags behind every other country in Europe on productivity. So look at ways of increasing that productivity. Uh, work with the digital champions and looking at how you can achieve that. Work with our delivery partners, Sussex Innovation, on how you might be able to innovate your processes within your business. And if there's a cost for any tools or any things that you need afterwards, then look at our grant fund and how we can support you with it. Okay, excellent. Okay, cost of capital, uh, call to action, final call to action. So, yes, my call to action was exactly the same as Lisa's. So head over to our <laughs> website, uh, look at the digital champion page, choose a champion and make sure that you take advantage of your free eight hours of support. Excellent. OK, uh, Zoe. Hi. So, yeah, um, obviously, if you want to innovate, we've talked about innovation, keeping agile and being resilient as businesses. So, of course, we've got lots of amazing workshops coming up that you can um, access for free. And I think, you know, because I'm not a marketeer, as a, as a customer, um, it's like finding out what what platforms do, do your customers use on an everyday basis? Um, and, you know, see if you can kind of, you know, get a sense of the, the, what the landscape is for, you know, for your, for your customers, but also thinking about potential customers, like what, what does the future look like? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and so I'm just quickly going to uh, wrap up. Okay, hang on, I've lost the, here we go. Here we go. Okay, lovely. Okay, well that wraps up. That's the final. That's our final session. So we are handing the baton on to series three, systems and productivity. It's had some introduction here. I would encourage you to book on to those uh, workshops. You can see here. Just head over to Recover and Rise on Eventbrite. We've also contact form for the digital support growth hub at Coast Capital coast to capital coast to capital .org .uk and get in touch with them and they will help you with all your needs and we've also talked about the business hothouse low case which is grant funding for low carbon projects and we've had rise on the call today okay so final one if you want to get in touch about your if you need help gdpr joe brianti is your go-to um, so admin at jlbbusinessconsulting.co.uk. Again, these slides will be shared afterwards. You'll be able to get in touch with Joe for any questions. I learned so much from Joe in that session. So thank you very much. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for an interesting and topical debate. <laughs> uh, great Cheers, question. Great answers. Thank you very much. We'll see you in series three. three. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Series three. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hey, well done. Great. <laughs>